We have just completed day two of the 2022 Humans to Mars Summit here at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. What a <laughs> wonderful, you could tell, that was a very exciting and very popular close for day two. We've all been looking forward to the unveiling of this uh, not just a spacesuit, but as you saw, a new technology, a suit for PPE. Of course, we have another full day tomorrow, the third and final day here at uh, uh, the uh, H2M uh, Summit. But we do have one more person to talk to today before I welcome uh, Beth Munn back in. And um, uh, that's the person standing right next to me, Melody. And I'll come up here so that you can look a little bit more to the camera. Uh, and I'll hang on to this. Uh, and I meant to ask, uh, Melody Yashar? Yes, Melody Yashar. Close enough. With Icon Technologies, you are the Director of Building Design and Performance? I am. I am the Director of Building Design and Performance at ICON. We develop large-scale additive manufacturing solutions for both Earth and space. So I've been a fan of your work, your team's work, for long, long before this day. And you got to feature some of that work here, and it's just a shame that we can't illustrate this conversation with some of that work, uh, because you design, well, habitats homes for people living off the surface of Earth, but also for Earth, which I'll come back to. The thing is that your homes are beautiful, your habitats, ice house, um, X house, which, which people also should take a look at. You know, so many of these um, lunar and Martian habitats that we see are, you would think from by necessity, piles of dirt or regolith because they need the radiation protection, which your team has taken into account, but you've come up with these beautiful homes that look like they would actually be places someone would want to live. And that was obviously a goal. Yes, that's right. We took a human-centric approach and designed what we felt, in all of these projects, frankly, um, what we felt would be the optimal experience for living on the surface of Mars for a one-year mission. In this case, most of our projects are focusing on a one-year mission. Um, so. Mo most of the teams I've collaborated with in the past, including Space Exploration Architecture, which was a company I co-founded, um, and now more recently with ICON, uh, as well as the Bjarke Ingels Group, who's a collaborating architect with ICON at the moment, we like to approach the architectural design in terms of what values we can provide from a human factors perspective first, and then synthesize those uh, value adds with other traditional traditional engineering constraints, like how do we mitigate against temperature differentials, or how do we create a pressurized environment, structurally speaking, and what are the materials we're going to use to actually create a functional habitat and a pressurized enclosure. So it's this combination of both human-centric um, design thinking sort of methodologies when it comes to thinking about human needs and human wants, combined with uh, synthesizing engineering constraints. And when you talk about materials that these habitats are made of, I think you're also talking about ISRU, in-situ resource utilization. Is that key to a lot of this? Yes, exactly. So for additive manufacturing and 3D printing to, to become a successful technology for building habitats on the moon and Mars, we need to leverage the local and indigenous materials on the surface of the planet and leverage ISRU to actually create construction feedstock and materials to create these radiation shields, pre unpressurized structures, and then eventually pressurized habitats. So ice, water ice, as a building material, which turns out to be pretty effective for doing the things you need a habitat to do, right? Yes, so the initial proposal that uh, the, the team Search Plus Clouds AO introduced to the NASA Centennial Challenge for a 3D printed habitat on Mars was a proposal for an ice habitat, 3D printed out of water ice. Um, what we introduced for that for that structure was a pressurized membrane that would then be 3D printed with well, 3D printed ice on the inside of that pressurized membrane. Um, water is a superior radiation shield over materials like aluminum and regolith, so that was a clear value add from our perspective to shield and protect the astronauts against galactic cosmic rays and solar particle events. And uh, this, was, this was the real benefit that we introduced in, uh, in introducing water ice as a construction material. 
Uh, maybe just a word also about the Mars X House. Both of these, basically winners of competitions, and, and maybe you could go on to talking about the NASA 3D printed habit, habitat uh, competition. Uh, that you won with both of these. Yes, that's right. So in 2015, NASA Centennial Challenges put out a public solicitation for uh, the general public to introduce concepts for 3D printed Mars habitats. They gave some general requirements and parameters for uh, the, the programs and areas that would be included within the habitat and some general parameters for materials and why those materials should be considered. Um, in the case of Mars Ice House, ice was never really considered as a construction material, so that was a new and innovative idea that I don't think anybody really expected. Um, despite that, we were fortunate to win first prize in the 2015 Phase 1 Challenge, and then when the competition was reinstated with different material requirements, um, we were fortunate enough to win first prize for Mars X House, which was a sulfur-based regolith habitat proposal. And I wish we could show the interiors because they are as beautiful as the exteriors. But again, well, we will just tell people, where can people see these designs? Sure. Um, if you want to, you can take a look at my website, melodyashara.com, um, Space Exploration Architecture, Clouds AO, as well as Bjarke Ingels are some of the groups that um, I've collaborated with over the last few years. And if you'd like to have more information about ICON, our website is iconbuild.com. What is Mars Dune Alpha? So Mars Dune Alpha is our uh, design for the CHIPIA analog. CHIPIA stands for the Crew Health and Performance Exploration Analog. This is... <laughs> well done. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long name, yes. Um, Mars Dune Alpha kind of sounds, rolls off the tongue, right? Like it's a little bit easier to say. Uh, so it is a 1,700 square foot analog habitat that we built in collaboration with NASA at the Johnson Space Center. It is going to house four volunteer crew members simulating a mission to Mars over the course of one year. And uh, what we did is we deployed our gantry style construction printer in the building, in, in building, building 220 at Johnson Space Center, uh, and basically 3D printed the habitat, and it should be in operation, I believe, in October for people to live in under as close to Mars analog conditions as, as we can achieve here on Earth, right? As close as we can design them to be, yes, that's right. And people should see the video that you showed in the session a few minutes ago with this amazing device, sort of a gantry, going back and forth and building this structure, which is now complete. Yes, if you take a look again at iconbuild.com, we have lots of videos showing how the gantry operates, um, what it looks like when it was deployed in Building 220 at Johnson Space Center, and uh, you can learn much more about the project there. So we're talking about the moon and Mars, but I know that you are also very concerned about how people live their living spaces here on Earth, perhaps in particular for people who live in less advantaged areas. And how is this work spilling over into helping people on Earth? So one of the key advantages of additive manufacturing and 3D printing as a construction technology is that we really believe that by scaling it up, we're going to introduce new efficiencies in building construction that you cannot have in traditional means and methods like with wood frame construction or using concrete masonry units. So we're able to, de to design and also to build faster and more affordably for those who need it. And it's one of our, it, it's really our mission icon to design accessible, dignified, and resilient housing solutions for the people and in the areas that need it most. Terrific work. Thank you so much, Melody. And uh, yeah, keep it up. And it's going to be fascinating to see people move in to that, uh, that home at the Johnson Space Center and see how they do. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right, we're going to step out of the way now because Beth Mund is here with uh, a representative, actually the leader of one of the sponsors of the uh, Humans to Mars Summit. Not the first time either, Beth. It's all yours. Oh, stay with us, Matt, if you'd like. Um, I'm okay. here. If you, I'm here with one of our 
treasured sponsors. Hello, Grant Anderson from Paragon. Welcome. Hello. It's great to be here. We're so glad you're here. Um, so many highlights throughout the day. You caught some incredible things this morning. And what did you think? Oh, well, it's always inspiring. You know, always keep the long-term view in mind, but look at all the short-term steps you have to get there. Uh, you know, we do life support. and It's the one thing we haven't proven about going to Mars. I mean, we, you know, yes, people have been up in the space station for a long time, but it's very accessible, easy to repair, easy to fix things, easy to get supplies to. Uh, it's a very different job going to Mars, and so we're thinking about the long term, but thinking about what the steps are to get there. That's fantastic. And we really appreciate that you and your team have come along and been part of this summit this year, and we appreciate your support as a sponsor very much. Thank you so much. Um, Matt, as we wrap up the day, I want to ask both of you some of the highlights that you've enjoyed. It's our rare opportunity to kind of wind it down and invite folks at home to know what they're missing so they come here next year. If you had the choice, what could you do next year that if you had an unlimited budget and the whole auditorium to yourself, what would you like the folks to know about what you're doing to get us to Mars? Well, first, is that a request? Yes, please. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> wow, if I had unlimited budget, I'd be doing uh, a full up uh, low Earth orbit uh, space station or space transit system analog. I mean, again, like I said, it hasn't been proven. We've got to get the equipment up there. We've got to get the philosophy of the design. You know, the, the space station was designed with what's called ORUs, orbital replacement parts. They were like 200 pounds each. You know, you wanted to replace a solar array, you had to replace a whole box. Really, we have to get that down into how do you replace the microstrips on a, on a board that have gone bad. You can't carry along everything. Um, 3D printing is not really the solution because you have to design that in from the beginning. You, you, you know, ask an engineer, don't use 7075 aluminum, use 6061 because that's the only one we can print with. They're not going to like that because they know that 7075 is a better solution, right? And, and so you, but you have to think about that and design that in. In fact, I have a standing challenge for any graduate student in the world, which is if you can come up with a governing equation that shows the break even of a 3D printing system, that I will pay for you to go to the conference to present the paper. And I will do that for any, any, uh, any non-hostile country in the United States. Nice. Uh, I nice. mean, in the world, I should say. Very nice. Also, do you need an analog astronaut to test any of this? Can I volunteer? <laughs> We need uh, people that are converting oxygen to CO2, yes. Um, uh, I qualify. We qualify. I do, but I don't have your experience as an analog astronaut. Well, let's so. get you some. I would love uh, that. But, but there's a big point in that, in that the life support system is something you can't test by speeding it up. You know, if, you, if you're qualifying a spacecraft for 30,000 cycles, you can do 30,000 cycles one every half an hour until you're done many years down the road, but you stay ahead of the fleet. You can't do that with biology. Biology doesn't grow faster just because you want it to. It, the, the fouling of filters the, and all that type of stuff, it, it really depends on the time. So if you want to be m doing a system that will go to Mars and back reliably and operate for three years with minimal amounts of maintenance and everything else, you need to start testing that now if you're going to fly it 10 years from now because you've got to get through two or three cycles to fix all the problems. Yeah. Very true, and still volunteering. Happy to do it. Mm -hmm. And we thank you, as always, for your support. And we're going to be wrapping up the day now here. This is day two, successfully in the books. We're going to invite you to join us back here for tomorrow. And we look forward to kicking it off with some really incredible programs. Matt, your impressions of the day and what you're looking forward to tomorrow? Uh, it's been fantastic. It has been uh, absolutely terrific. Um, uh, this, what a close we had with this demonstration of a spacesuit. Uh, but I think... Uh, in part, sort of, you know, encapsulating what you've just said, Grant, and it's something we've heard a couple of times, if not more, across the conference. Uh, rocket science, okay, maybe it's not easy, but it's not as hard as keeping people alive and healthy and happy on that three-year mission that you were talking about. And, and, and really, that's the question I had for you, which is, sure, a lot of challenges left, but the progress that we've made, the progress that I know that you guys have made at Paragon is pretty impressive, isn't it? Uh, yeah, we're going to be announcing something with NASA next month on a big milestone on getting to Mars. I, w I won't spoil it at this point in time. Um, but 
yeah, we we are continually looking at all the technologies, whether it's SOE, which is solid oxide electrolysis converting CO2 to oxygen, like the MOXIE does, which was talked about today, um, to how do you house somebody on on Mars, you know? And and the 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 the, the, the uh, the news about the spacecraft that's dying because of the dust on its solar arrays is very pertinent to what we're doing because we see this all the time. I have a standard chart I put up, which is the all the artist renderings of Mars habitats and say what's wrong with all of them. And one of the first things I point out is the solar arrays. If you have a two and a half month dust, dust storm where you have essentially zero light hitting the surface, you need a backup power system and batteries aren't going to last. So I've always said if you want to have a permanent colony on Mars, you need a medium sized nuclear reactor to work with. And we've got to start developing that. And I've seen in the last year, we're starting now to develop it. But uh, it, it's going to have to happen if you want a permanent settlement there. Mm -hmm. Wow, I'm ready. I know. Space is hard. Mars is, Mars is harder. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, as I said, we're wrapping it up. We're thanking our sponsors very, very sincerely. Thank you, Grant, very much. And thank you to Paragon. You know, in the analog industry, Paragon's the place to work, I hear. It's fantastic. So congratulations. A lot of folks I know there, very, very happy. So congrats. Matt, as we kick it off, or wrap it up today and then kick it back up tomorrow, um, we'll, we'll be wrapping it up with one of the most incredible, I think, finales. And we're all going to have this really great discussion on how we're going to do all this. Are you ready? Yeah, I, this is maybe my favorite uh, portion of H2M each year. And it's where we take on the sort of why we do this question, which is, and this one is particularly significant considering what's going on in the world. How can Mars or as my boss Bill Nye would put it, how can space bring us together? Well, it does bring us together. We've seen that over and over. And, you know, let's hope that it continues to have that power. So I'm looking forward to that last session tomorrow. Appreciate you watching. Appreciate you coming back tomorrow. So we'll see you right back here for the Humans to Mars Summit. Good night. <laughs>